We invite you to join us for the 2021 Bluegrass Bible Conference brought to you by Crosswork Bible Church, which will be held on June 18th, 19th, and 20th at the Holiday Inn Conference Room located at 1000 Vandalay Drive, Frankfort, Kentucky. Food and drinks will be provided. The theme for this year is, What's Going On in the World? Some topics will include the Foundations for Society, the chipping away at the foundation, the Bible is more relevant than you think, among many other topics. We encourage you to join us for this free event. There are no registration fees and no cost for food. For more information and free registration, visit crosswordministries.org or call us at 502-249-8034. We hope to see you there. Welcome to Recovered Truths. My name is Greg Reese, the pastor here at Crosswork Bible Church. Um, we thank you for joining us on the TV program today, and we invite you to come join us on Sunday mornings at uh, Holiday Inn Express Conference Room. That's where we're currently meeting right now. Uh, we meet at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings for fellowship, and at 10.30 we get on with the service. So if you'd like to come join us in person, uh, we, would, we would gladly have you join us. The only thing we ask is when you come, bring a King James Bible, a pen and a piece of paper, and be prepared to study God's Word uh, because that's the issue. One of the things we've talked about before is the name of the church is Crosswork Bible Church because the crosswork is the only thing that matters and the Bible is the thing that tells us about that crosswork and that's why, that's why we chose that as the name for the Crosswork Bible Church that we have. Uh, those are the two most important things, the Bible and the crosswork of Jesus Christ. So join us in person if you would. Uh, if not, uh, as, as, as long as you can join us through the TV program, you might not be able to get out. Uh, we thank you for joining us this way as well. Uh, if you've been joining us for quite some time, hopefully you know that we're going through the book of Romans. And we're up in Romans chapter 8. We're not quite about halfway through Romans chapter 8, but we've been dealing with some things to make sure that we know some things going forward. Now, uh, just as a recap, uh, for those that may be joining us the first time, uh, Romans chapters 1 through 5 lay down the foundation for our justification. Uh, the fact that we have been saved by placing our faith in what Jesus Christ did. And not just that, but God has justified us. He has declared us righteous because we're in the Son, because we're in Christ. And so then he goes on a little bit more in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 and talks about our, our identification, the who we are in Christ. And so then that's why it's important when he starts off in Romans chapter 6 talking about our identification with Jesus Christ in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. And how the, the, the Holy Spirit's baptism where He takes us and places us into living union with Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That His death becomes our death. His burial is now our burial. His resurrection is now our resurrection. And that's a glorious place to be is in Christ. Now, the opposite of that would be if you're in Adam. And if you're in Adam, we know in Adam all die. But in Christ, we're able to have eternal life. You go back to John, you find out eternal life is that we might know God. That's what eternal life is all about. And so that's why it's important for us to know some things. And that's why he starts off in Romans chapter 6, knowing. And then he gets on a little bit farther in chapter 6 and talks about reckon to be true for yourself. Take the things that you know and count it to be true for yourself. And what we've said before is you take that head knowledge and you move it down into your heart. And then the natural consequence of that is going to be that your, your body is going to yield to that truth that you've stored up in your soul. And the only way that you can do that is because it's Christ's life living in and through you. And we find out in Romans chapter 6 that we're dead to sin. Sin no longer has power or control over us. When we sin, it's because we choose to. And we have a choice not to. And it's an amazing thing that we find out there. Romans chapter 7 starts talking to us about the fact that we're dead to the law. 
the Ten Commandments, the 613 Commandments, none of those are for you and I today as members of the church, the body of Christ. In fact, Paul tells us that the law is for the unrighteous, the ungodly, those that are dead in, in Adam, so that they can know their position. We've said it here before, you're, when, when, when people go to hell, it's not because they've sinned. It's because that's where they were going and that's why they sinned. But the thing is, is you can stop where you're going. If you've never placed your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that He died for your sins, that He was buried and rose again the third day, and we find out in Romans that that's the thing that God takes and, and gives you His righteousness if you believe that Christ died for you. He takes His righteousness and gives it to you, takes your sin and places it on the Son, and then you're no longer under that control of sin. In fact, if you go commit a sin, it's not going to be charged against you. It's already been paid for and you've already been forgiven. We've looked at that already. And it's really important for us to know that the law brings... It's a, it's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We don't live after the law after we're saved because we know we can't. And that's what Romans chapter 7 deals with. He says, you're dead to the, you're dead to the law. Well then, if I'm dead to the law, what can I do? Well, how do I serve? Romans chapter 8 tells you, you don't serve based off the flesh. We find out that the flesh and to be carnally minded are the same. And He tells us to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so then, that's where we find ourselves here in Romans chapter 8. We talked about the fact that there's, there's some positions that we have. Uh, we have a position in the first five verses of Romans chapter 8 that has to do with our spirit. And we, we, we know that we're dead to the flesh now in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 6 says you're dead to sin. 7 says you're dead to the law. And Romans chapter 8 says you're dead to the flesh that you might be able to live after the spirit. You don't have to live after the law. You have to live after the Spirit. In fact, he tells us not by the letter of the law, but by the Spirit that we live. And like I said, we have this position that we're dead to the flesh in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Then we're given a provision. And as we said the last couple messages is, God's not left us here on our own saying, figure it out. People claim that we're, we're hands-off. God is, that We teach that God is hands-off. No, He's hands-on, but it's different. God doesn't speak to us through signposts and, and, and problems that we have in life and struggles and all those things. Why? Because everybody's got those things. No, God is hands-on with the body of Christ today through His Word. And by the way, by the Spirit. We've looked at it before. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about the fact that we have the Spirit and the Spirit allows us to live according to God's Word. The Holy Spirit teaches us comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So much so that He tells us at the end of chapter 2 verse 16 that we have the mind of Christ right here in this book. We have access to it right here. And that's the provision that He gives us. He's not left us here on our own to figure it out. He says, here's how it's going to work. And then in verses 9 through 13, here's the product of what it looks like. And so we saw that there was a, a really a, a nice, clear way to uh, do a layout or an outline, if you will, of Romans chapter 8. And we talked about that before, right? Uh, verses 1 through 5, we have our position. The fact that we're dead to the flesh. Right? We are we're dead to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. Then he goes on a little bit farther and he gives us that provision in, in verses 6 through 9. He says, here's how to live with now that you're dead to the flesh, you live after the Spirit. 
And then he tells us in verses 9 through 13, he says, here's the product. Here's what that position will produce if you use the provision. And it's really amazing because we get to see that. But it doesn't stop there. In fact, what we find out is in verses in verse 14, we're given a position that we are the sons of God. That's a positional truth that is true whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not. If you're a saved individual today, that's your position. You know, we've talked about this before. The moment you get saved, you're sanctified. That means you're set apart. You're glorified. You, you've already got these things. You're forgiven of all trespasses. And you can live your life not knowing those things and begging God every day, please forgive me. And He's up there saying, I already have. Believe what my Word says and live the life as, an, as a forgiven person. Being thankful that you're forgiven. And you don't have that guilt and that shame anymore. And it, it allows you to deal with it in a way that you couldn't deal with it before. Religion won't allow you to deal with it the way that grace does. Then we've got verses 15 through 17. Gives us the provision. How does this new position as a son of God work? God has not, again, He has not left us alone to figure it out. He's given us provision to live as sons of God right now today in this present evil world. We're going to do it way out there in the ages to come. When we're, when we're, when we're working in those positions of rank and authority in the heavenly places, we're going to be able to do all those things then, but God's saying, you can do it right now today if you choose to do so. But the only way you can do that is allow my word to work in and through you to produce that. Then verses 18 through 39, he gives us again the product. What's it look like? Right? And so that's where we're going to go today. Notice here in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Here's our, here's our new position. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God... By the way, are we led by the Spirit of God? Well, if we read the first 14 verses and we're not, and we're not living after the flesh, then we are. How is it that you are led of the Spirit? Real quick, let's go over to the book of Ephesians. Because this is, this is really important for us to be able to know and understand what's going on here. There's, there's, there's something with being the, a son of God that a lot of folks we, we have trouble with for whatever reason. Right? But how is, it, how is it, as he states there in Romans chapter 8, how is it that we can know these things? How is it that we can actually believe these things? How is it that this life can actually be produced in us? How are we led by the Spirit? Let's take a look at this. Ephesians chapter 5. Get Ephesians chapter 5 in one hand and go ahead and get Colossians chapter 3 in the other one. Because this is, this is really interesting. Because a lot of times we don't think about this stuff. And a lot of times what we do is we think, well, if we're, if we're living after the Spirit, that means we're running aisles and speaking in tongues and all that stuff. And that's not what being led of the Spirit is. And we'll find that out. Notice, here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Alright? So what's it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Okay, Paul's going to give us 
Paul's going to give us a list of things that tells us this is what it looks like when you're filled with the Spirit. Verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Not the running aisles and, and jumping pews and and speaking in tongues and screaming and hooting and hollering and all that stuff. By the way, it's not found in modern worship music either. By the way, if you want to know what real worship with God is, is trusting His Word and allowing His Word to work in and through you to produce a life. And when you do that, that's how you worship God. Not through, not through music and things like that. Music is great. I love music. But when the doctrine is wrong and we think that that's a replacement for true worship, then that becomes a problem. But I want you to notice something here. What's it mean to be filled with the Spirit? He gives us a list of things, right? Go over to Colossians chapter 3. Because the way that we find out what it means to be filled with the Spirit is we go ask our our pastor or somebody else or, or we go look at a concordance and uh, find out what it is, or we do a, a Google search or something. No, what we, if, if you're not sure about something in Scripture, what do we do? We keep reading. And by the way, the greatest commentaries ever written on the book of Ephesians is the book of Philippians and Colossians. So if you want to put down commentaries, get in this book and find out what God's actually saying, not what, God, what some guy thinks it's saying. Notice here, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Notice he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Alright, so I'm going to put this phrase up here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Okay. And I want you to notice something. The list that Paul gave us to be filled with the Spirit shows up right here with this one. Notice, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Those two lists are are pretty much the same. So then, that tells me being filled with the Spirit produces something. And again, like I said, music's not a problem. But when you have false doctrine and things like that within it, then it becomes a problem. So when we're speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and then he says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. How? By doing the exact same thing. Speaking to to one another in 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 in, in songs and music and spiritual spiritual psalms and all that stuff. You know what that means? If this and letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly produce the same thing, then it means to be filled with the Spirit means to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There's a there's a property in mathematics that says if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That's exactly what that is right there. Filled with the Spirit produces this stuff. Letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly produces this stuff. The exact same list. So that means being filled with the Spirit is the same as letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's all it is. Now isn't that simple? It's not something that you have to go off into a prayer closet and then pray to God and just hope that you can break through to the ceiling to be able to get it so God can hear your prayers. It's get in the book, get into the King James Bible and allow it to tell you what God's doing today. And if you let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, then you will be led by the Spirit to live that life that He's designed for it to live in and through us. Go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 14. 
For as many as of us that are led of the Spirit, that we're filled with the Spirit, we're allowing God's Word to dwell in us richly. Notice he says, they are the sons of God. There's something there that sons of God, and he's going to talk about this adoption that we have, that a lot of folks have made a mess out of. There's an adoption that we have that God takes, and here's the thing, a lot of times we look at adoption and as far as the world goes and we say, this person is not in our family, we're going to adopt them and bring them into our family. This is different. This adoption that Paul's talking about here, that the Holy Spirit through Paul is talking about here, is God taking someone in his family and making them a son of God. Positionally. And eventually, it's going to be something that we will fulfill. But we can live today as a son of God because if we're led of the Spirit, we are the sons of God. That's our position. What about the provision? How is it possible then? Brother Greg, well, I'm glad you asked. Verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received. By the way, he's talking to saved individuals here, and he's saying, ye already have this spirit of adoption. It's not something you have to wait for. There's not some second blessing. There's no such thing as a second blessing. Now, I know what people do. They'll say, well, you've got to get baptized in the water, then you've got to get baptized by the Spirit, and then you can start speaking in tongues and all that stuff. That's not what he's talking about. You're not, you're not Israel. You're not Acts 2 Pentecostal Israel. We are members of the church, the body of Christ. God is doing something completely different today. And if we don't know that, then we can't live as sons of God. Notice, he says, but ye have received. They already have it. It's not something they're waiting on. They already have it. You received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now you do a search through Scripture and find out how many people's ever cried, Abba, Father, and you're going to find one person. And that's Jesus Christ when He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before He goes to the cross. And what was, his, what was, what was the thing that He said is what? Not my will, but thine be done. You stop and you think about that. If, if we're able to say the exact same thing, say, not what I want to be done, but what you want to be done, do you know what we've just done? We've chosen to, to, to accept God's will rather than doing what we want to do. That means you've got a choice in things, folks. We can believe that we're sons of God and that we have this spirit of adoption, or we can't. It's one of the two. Keep on going in this provision. Verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So here's the thing. He's saying, you're a child of God and I'm going to take you and make you a son of God through that spirit of adoption. We'll find out what that adoption is here in a moment. But notice... And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. When you take a look at that, what happens is the moment that you get saved, you become an heir of God. And a joint heir with Christ. Everything that belongs to Him now belongs to us because we're in Him. Because of that position that we have, He's given us provision. Here's how you can go and live it. Knowing that you have something 
and then he's going to tell us how that product is going to come about. So we, we continue on in verses 18 and so on. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But notice, we'll look at this real quick. Drop down to verse uh, 23. We're, we're going to spend a little bit more time on, on the next video going through that, 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 that adoption that we have. The fact that we're heirs and joint heirs. We'll take a look at that a little bit more. But notice, what is this adoption? Notice in verse 23, 823. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, notice, waiting for the adoption. So we're given the spirit of adoption, but we're waiting for that adoption, notice, to wit, the redemption of our body. Do you know what that adoption, do you know when it takes place? When our body is redeemed at the rapture of the church. Whether you die now or you die later. Or if you don't die at all and you go up into the rapture, what's going to happen is, is your body is going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That corruptible is going to be going to put on incorruption. That mortal is going to put on immortality. And then at that time, you'd be able to say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? It's going to be a glorious day. And the, what, the thing that you're going to do is you're going to be a son of God, but you can live right now as a son of God. And we'll see that as we go down through here. But notice, that, that adoption that we're waiting for is the redemption of our body. And you stop and think about this. We talked about this at the very beginning as we were going through this. We talked about this is spirit, soul, and body. This is spirit, soul, and body. The moment you get saved, your spirit is made alive. Your soul is given light. And your body, well, it's still waiting to be redeemed. And one of these days we're going to get a body fashioned like unto His glorious body. And we're going to be able to rule and reign in the heavens to glorify God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glorify the Godhead. And all the things that they did. And we'll take a look at that a little bit more as we go on next time. I want to end off with giving you another opportunity to get this booklet. It's called Dictionary of the Gospel. Uh, it's a free booklet, absolutely free of charge. If you'd like a copy of it, you can contact us, give us a phone call, or send us an email, and we'll send these out to you as quickly as we possibly can. Dictionary of the Gospel. Again, the book's not the big issue, but it's designed to get you into the Bible. I want to thank you for joining us today, and until next time, grace and peace.